Hi, this is Sandy Baird for What's Happening, our local uh, news commentary, uh, mainly a lot today about local news as well as the COVID virus and the local shutdowns of most of many of our small businesses and the continuing shutdowns that have happened as a result of that virus. And with me today is Jared Carter, a professor at Vermont Law School, and Pete Garitano, a retired citizen of this fair region and of uh, the United States. And we're here to comment about what's happening in our local situation in politics and also in the world. And so we'll start today maybe with a local piece of information from Jared. What's going on with you? Yeah. Well, what, thanks, what, what, what happened yesterday is what it interests me. Uh, what happened yesterday? Oh, you mean the, the city council uh, meeting? Meeting to. Uh, Behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah, on Zoom. I, well, I don't know. Why don't you, you start with this? No, you know, I'm happy well, to jump in. Okay. The reason that I'm concerned about local politics, and I think we're all concerned about mm -hmm. politics in general, is that the virus has been, the result of the virus has been the shutdown of many of our local businesses, mm -hmm. of our public spaces, frankly, I believe of the government itself. City Hall is yeah. still locked up, the libraries are locked up, and no one can really access our local governments very easily. And it's all because of this supposed spread of this mm -hmm. uh, virus. And I think Pete Garitano, our friend over here will have stuff to say about that, but um, but I did want to talk to Jared Carter as well because he is very interested in local politics, as I am, and mm -hmm. I think he basically ha maybe could even tell us a little bit about the mayor's race, mm -hmm. which will happen in March. Mm -hmm. But last night, was yesterday, it wasn't last night, right. it was at noon, special meeting of the city council was, wasn't really called. Was it? I mean, I don't. I saw no notices of it anywhere. Did you? No. Okay. If the mayor scheduled a uh, city council meeting from noon till one o'clock, and of course it was on Zoom. And as a result of that, the city council unanimously passed a resolution to control alcohol sales in our city, and they had to be shut off alcohol sales at first of all ten o'clock but then it was extended to 11, which is basically going to hurt small bars, restaurants, and all the places which sell liquor. Some of them don't even get started till 10 or 11 yeah. o'clock, like, you yeah. know, Red Square. So I wanted to get Jared's comments yeah. about that and, and just what did you think? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I don't remember the last time I made it up till 11 o'clock at night, um, so I wouldn't be uh, at those bars anyway. But one thing I would say that both here in Burlington and nationally, the pandemic's impact on small businesses has been great. Great. It's been no, well, great. Crushing. 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 Right. Exactly. Uh, absolutely crushing. And I think you're seeing it a historic moment where huge swaths of the economy that were already moving in this direction are moving more quickly towards e-commerce and the e-commerce giants mm -hmm. that are going to further and further control the economy and further and further exacerbate this income disparity that that is at pandemic proportions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, it is very troubling. We see it becoming harder and harder for local small businesses, bars, restaurants, uh, the mom and pop shops, mm -hmm. the function in our society. Uh, and I'm not personally convinced that getting back to your point about the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock curfew hour, uh, I'm all for following the data mm -hmm. and, and, and following the science where it leads, whether I believe in it politically or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen any data that shows that a bar that's struggling to survive during this pandemic is suddenly less safe at 11.01 p.m. than it was at 10.59 p.m. Mm -hmm. In other words, if it's safe enough to have those places open until 10.59, I'm not sure what the, what the rationale is for closing them at 11 one minute later, uh, especially when, in listening to folks around the city, uh, they're really struggling to survive and no, not, not sure that they can. So what impact does that have not only on the business owners, the building owners, but also the people that work in the service industry, mm -hmm. uh, which is a huge part of our mm -hmm. community. And the, they're young people. And they're young too. people, ab absolutely. So um, uh, I'm, I am concerned that there's this sentiment uh, of almost one-upsmanship, right? We've got to one-up the next person. We've got to show that we're tougher uh, as About opposed what? to, well, right. tougher on the virus as opposed to smarter. Uh, and so if there was actual evidence to show that at 11.01 p.m. the bars are less safe than they were at 
you know, maybe I could get with that because I haven't been to the bars until 11 o'clock at night in a long time. But without that, it just doesn't make sense. And it has massive impacts on the small businesses, I think, in this community that are the beating heart of Burlington. And really what makes us It's the beating heart of the United States of America. Right. So we have a huge, I think we have a huge wealth transfer going on right now. And to me, that is as troubling as any of the other wealth components Wealth transfer. Why don't you say what that means to you, or to the, to the economy? Well, if you look at the, the, the Jeff Bezos of the world, the Bill Gates of the world, the, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, their wealth has increased since this pandemic became, uh, began by billions of dollars. Why? Because people are now having to rely, because of quarantines, because, they're, because of other measures of, of, of government, uh, having to rely on e-commerce, buying things online, engaging with the economy Education online. online. Education online. Education uh, online. And so these companies and their owners, really, uh, stand to become mo much more powerful than they already are, right? Uh, during the presidential election, uh, Senator Sanders was, was always railing against the 1% and, and the income inequality that our economy had. That has only gotten worse. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's as troubling as anything else uh, because as soon as that income inequality grows, the political power shifts even further than it already has, and those 1% are able to control the levers of government to their financial and political gains. And that's really, really troubling. Tying that back to Burlington, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's exactly why it's so important that we follow the data, we follow the science, uh, and we come together as a community to make sure we can support these small businesses. Because without them, without the students uh, that, that, that really make this city what it is, without every member of the community, I think uh, we're gonna make things worse uh, and uh, we've got a long way to go. So um, I, think it's, I think it's troubling seeing what's going on around Burlington right now, but I'm optimistic. Why? <laughs> well, I, look, I'm, I'm optimistic by nature. Uh, yeah, I guess. As, as you mm -hmm. maybe know. Uh, and I look around and I've certainly seen, and you're, you're, you, you both study history. Yes. Uh, you, you look at the times that people have been knocked down. Uh, uh, and we've always gotten back up, and usually we've gotten back up better. Mm, Not okay. perfectly, but l let me just l hear me out. So think of about, course, think about the, rev the, rev the revolution. Yeah. American Revolution, right? We got our Bill of Rights out of that. Mm -hmm. All right? I'm a constitutional lawyer, you practice constitutional law, I know Pete's a fan of the Constitution. We got our constitutional rights out of that. They weren't perfect, right? Obviously they, they were, they were uh, basically geared towards white men, uh, women, African Americans, Native Americans uh, didn't benefit from that. But we got our constitutional rights out of crisis. Yeah. Civil War. Yeah. We got Massive upheaval. We ended slavery. We got the 13th, yep. 14th, and 15th Amendments. Right. That birthed Jim Crow. So. A few steps forward, pushed back. The the Great Depression. Uh, again, history is an interesting topic, but the Great Depression. We got uh, a new a big deal. War well, is we, what got, we got a big war too, but we got we got a new deal. We got Social Security. Yeah. We got some of these these things that help support people. Um, and so every time I've seen this country, and Burlington is a leader, or has historically been a leader, I think, in this country, get knocked down, we get back up and we improve. And so that's why I'm optimistic. I, I don't see why this would be any different. I don't see why if we come together as a community, small businesses, students, seniors, working people, uh, uh, come together as a community, that Burlington can't be part of leading that recovery, that building Burlington back recovery that we just so need. Well, do we need new political leaders to do that? What do you think? I mean, the thing that interests me about this whole crisis is that what happened? How come that meeting was at noon mm -hmm. to one o'clock? How come the citizens of Burlington did not know enough to zoom into this mm -hmm. meeting? How come the mayor did this almost by fiat? And mm -hmm. how come? Why are we being denied even knowledge of what the mayor is doing? Mm -hmm. Because he will continue to use the excuse of COVID to keep the right. government shut down. By the way, is the legislature going to reopen mm -hmm. in person? Do you know that? I'm not sure. Yeah. It isn't, is it? I don't know. I mean, it's all, I mean, to comment about a couple of um, uh, first points is that um, the small businesses are hurting. The difference, I look back at 08, the mm -hmm. big financial collapse. The difference between this collapse and the 08 collapse is businesses were hurting, but nobody was forced to shut down. Right. So right. people didn't have money and jobs, people lost jobs, but nobody said you can't be open. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So there's businesses that are gonna go under because they're not even allowed to be open. It's not, I mean, before they could have been open, maybe like a lifeline, they might have been selling less of what they were selling. Mm -hmm. But now there's been businesses that aren't allowed, haven't been allowed to sell anything for months and months and months, yeah. and they're not gonna survive. And the people that we're talking about that are gonna lose their jobs are all the, I mean, most of them I would say are people that are making between minimum wage and maybe $30,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Those are the jobs that are the, in, at the, the biggest risk and recently, the, the money the government was given got cut in half. Mm -hmm. So now, I mean, I read where 80% of New York restaurants could go under in the next month. 80? 80%. Right. I mean, you're right. talking 10,000 restaurants in the next month because they're going to be a default on their, right. their, uh, their lease. I mean, can you imagine that? How many people is that employed? I can't imagine it, what's it, happening. So, I just can't. And to me, the logic of this whole thing, and you said something about being strong. Well, mm. we've passed the point where that's there's any logic to that because mm -hmm. Vermont is so clean right now. Mm -hmm. You look at Europe. Europe reopened way before they were at the level Vermont's at now. Vermont is lower than any European country right now, and they opened mm -hmm. what two, three, four weeks ago. Italy, Spain, who had horrible COVID deaths. Okay, mm -hmm. according to that. so the, these people had re were as bad as say New York City. Those were some of the big areas, right. Northern Italy. Well, they said, okay, it's time to go. I mean, the, the thing has died down, let's open up. Vermont has never got to there with their numbers, and mm -hmm. now they're way below even in testing. I mean, it's ludicrous to me that they're making the students do what they do when, when they had tested 998 students and six of them became were positive. That's like 0.2%, yes. okay? Six. six out of 998. There is no problem right now okay it is below any level that in the past you would we would have ever said we have a pandemic still and it's, it's not happening now yeah. so it's really time I mean there should have been a line drawn in the sand where they said okay when we reach this level one percent positives or whatever it is then we can reopen it's safe and it's mm -hmm. been stated by the CDC that's five percent we're at 0.2 to 0.5 percent we're way past the time to open up it, it's time to open up it, it's it's ludicrous I don't know who is directing this thing or why they're doing what they're mm -hmm. doing but there's absolutely no reason for it yeah yeah i'm, I'm i mean you brought point out the students yeah. uh, i think i think this idea that the students are somehow it's, it's us versus them that they mm -hmm. are, are are outsiders they're that, vectors of disease well, well, that's I mean, how we see them fine uh, but this us versus them the students are are such an important part of i this know community. they're it's, members know. of this community they are a big part of what makes this community thrive uh, and I'm all for being safe uh, and making sure sure we follow the data, follow the science as best as we can, as imperfect as it is. Uh, uh, but in the end, we've got to find a way to support these students yes, coming back absolutely. and embrace them coming back. Otherwise, all of those small businesses are going to be, uh, uh, you know, fall prey to the, the Bezos of the world. The Be Jeff Bezos and several other uh, of these, these you know, more, point zero 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 one percenters, yeah. uh, I think... My data might not be exact, but somewhere around $150 billion they've made since this pandemic began. That is sickening. These businesses that are about to close down, uh, uh, these guys should be kicking in to keep them going, uh, if nothing else. That's, that's not, they don't care about those small businesses. I read an yeah. interesting one the other day, or just two days ago, that Apple stock value went from $1 trillion to $2 trillion yeah. in three months. Yeah. $1 trillion increase. A trillion. Yeah. Well, there was an article that I talked about, I think, with you guys even uh, in an email by Naomi Klein, who's an economist and a sociologist from the left also. She's not a right-winger at all. And she's a big supporter of Bernie Sanders. And what she describes as what, what is happening really is a transformation of capitalism. Yeah. You know, a, a real evolution in the stages of capitalism, which means that the small businesses are being cut out and shut down and collapsed for the benefit of these big monopolies and that we are moving into a stage of really monopoly capitalism where places like Amazon get all yeah. the profit. And, and what, I, what I'm saying is at least since the, the early 80s, Burlington has rejected that well, uh, we in, thought in, so. in, in many respects. And you look at uh, places like, and I know you were involved in this, fight the waterfront, public spaces, Church Street Marketplace. I mean, these were radical ideas mm -hmm. at the time that we're going to have a publicly accessible, granted, mall uh, 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 commercialism there. but but we were gonna have a public space. The waterfront was gonna be public. Places like Burlington Telecom were gonna be public assets. Right. In many ways, Burlington put itself on the map because it rejected that sort of doctrine uh, uh, of vulture capitalism, right. really. And, and, and that's what made us attractive to students, mm -hmm. 
to, to people wanting to come and live here and build the economy and grow the economy because we're different. Uh, and I think right now, this beautiful Lake Champlain behind us, it sort of feels like we're adrift on Lake Champlain. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's all within the context of the, 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 you know, the on ongoing pandemic. Um, but I think we do, we, we need to get back uh, to focusing on uh, what made, and I think has the potential to make Burlington exceptional again. We need to start believing that we are exceptional, uh, that this community oh, is know. exceptional, right? And I, but I think a lot of people are feeling tired, uh, and so we need a vision yeah, for this city that 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 allows people to embrace that, to remember what it's like to lead, uh, to bring Burlington back, uh, and to really feel good about it again. Mm -hmm. Try some new new approaches to, to, to old problems, right? Lincoln said, uh, you know, something along the lines of the, the dogmas of the quiet past are incompatible with the stormy present. And I think in, in many respects, nice. Burlington mm -hmm. used to operate that way. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And we've 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 lost our way. We've got we've sold off Burlington Telecom. We've we've considered privatizing Church Street. Uh, we had to fight uh, we've, about we've that. Put in, we've had to fight about that. We we we, we lock homeless people up historically uh, recently um uh, we put in a lot of fancy uh, yacht slips for canadians who can't even come here anymore mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's what every other city and that's that's anywhere usa and that's what i mean by we're adrift on lake champlain we need to get back to being exceptional build burlington back bring burlington back and that takes a vision uh, uh, and I think it's lacking uh, at, at the city level right now. But, okay, yes, no, I totally agree with you about that. However, the counter-argument from our mayor, mm -hmm. apparently, is that in terms of we have to stay safe, not free, yeah. not creative, but we have to stay safe because of this uh, pandemic. So, Pete, maybe, what, well, what, how would you answer that? <laughs> well, um, I think I agree with that, that people are tired, they're worn out because I mean, there's never in the history of our lives been a media blitz about anything, not about a war, not about terrorism that's gone on relentlessly 24 7 on every TV station not about Fox. this. No, no, but they're still talked about. Yeah, it's still but, talked yeah, about, yes. And, mm -hmm. the, and, and the message is it's kind of like it's worse than the terrorism thing where, you know, when you go through an airport, I always hate the fact that I have to go through this thing because that means they're assuming I'm a criminal and I feel that's offensive, that it, I should not be a uh, suspected terrorist. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for anybody, you know, they have everything they know about. I mean, they can look and, you know, through all their files and see that I've never done anything that would make me a suspected terrorist. So why do I have to ever go through mm -hmm. airport security, okay? Well, now they're saying everybody is a suspected typhoid Mary, basically. Anybody can infect you. You got to be careful. It could be that guy. It could be that guy. Wear a mask. Stay six feet. And it's all baloney. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's just, it's the craziest thing that has happened that people that don't trust the media, they don't trust the government, and they don't they trust... They don't the, trust Trump in particular. Well, well there's 50% that don't trust one side, 50% yeah, right. don't trust right. the other side. It depends on who's in the castle at the time. The, mm -hmm. it, you know, for the last eight years, there, there was 50% that didn't trust Obama. So it, right. it doesn't matter who's there. They, they don't trust... And they don't generally trust pharmaceutical companies, and that's that's who's really making out right now. And, mm -hmm. and people say to me, "Well, uh, what do you think? It's some big conspiracy?" Not necessarily. I think you have opportunists, whether mm -hmm. they're Amazon opportunists or the pharmaceutical companies. They see an opening. They see a chance where this thing's going to go. And they saw it. I guarantee you. In March, when this started, somebody went, "Wow," you know, and and said, "We're going to make a lot of money from this." And 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 uh, how? Well, when everybody got closed into their houses, everybody that was in any kind of tech industry knew that they were gonna they were gonna make money, right? But Amazon the knew they were gonna make money. All the stores yeah. closed. You couldn't go out and go shopping. Yeah. They knew where they were gonna make money, and the pharmaceutical companies certainly knew they were gonna make money as soon as this happened. They've been trying to get a vaccine out for a virus for 30 years, and they've never once succeeded. Okay, they've never succeeded because what has happened every time it's it's happening right now is. The virus came and it went, and right about the end of it, they almost got the vaccine ready, and that's why they're rushing this one because they want to get it there before it's gone. I mean, it's gone in Europe, it's gone in the Northeast United States, it'll be gone probably in the same period of time in the South. It's usually a six month thing. If you look back at any of these things, whether it was SARS, whether it was MERS, whether it was the last, or the swine flu, they all lasted about the same amount of time. They peaked, they went out, they were done. It kind of there was a, there was some kind of an immunity or the thing just died out, and there's really not a big difference in this one. The big difference is that we're testing healthy people and telling them they're sick. 
Mm. And that has never, ever happened before. It's the test that we're using that just got invented and approved when the, the swine flu came along, okay? Mm -hmm. And that was the first time this PCR test was ever used. But back then, it was a new technology, and I, I have CDC documents here, but I won't, I won't actually, I'll just quote from them, but you can look this up. They were telling people, don't go in. This is during swine flu, which was killing children. This was, this was predominantly killing children, okay, back in 2009. They were telling people, okay, well, if you have the flu and you're sick, just stay home. You don't really need to go to the doctor. Think of how opposite that is yeah, right now. Yeah. If you get really sick, then go to the hospital, then we'll test you and see what you have. That is the exact polar opposite of what's happening now. Now they're telling people, you may be sick and we're gonna tell you, even though you don't have symptoms, we'll tell you if you're sick and then you have to stay away from people. If they had had this technology back then, they could have done the same thing with the swine flu. In retrospect, they looked, and you can look on CDC files again, and they estimated 30 million people had the swine flu, but it's an estimate just from the small amount of people that actually got tested, which was very, very small, because only sick people were getting tested. Right. Certain amount of people died, but they have this big range and say, well, maybe more, more died and we didn't know. Okay, so this test has is, is been the big thing that has caused the panic, and people have so many viruses in them that don't do anything to them, and that's why you have these asymptomatic people Mm -hmm. They have this viral RNA in them. It doesn't necessarily become infectious. It's there, just like herpes, just like mono, just like all these other viruses. There's apparently 200 different viruses uh, possibly in everyone's body that have been identified as infectious viruses. And they're just there. They, mm -hmm. They're just there. They don't necessarily do anything at any time. So every year UVM students came back, we could say, okay, let's test you for something. I guarantee you, if you picked one of them, you could find six out of 998 that had this. And if you wanted to test them for herpes, you could probably find 400 out of them. Right, so what do you do next year? We're, we're kind of worried about herpes. Let's bring everybody in and give them the PCR test and see if they have herpes and create a panic. Well, you have herpes, you can't kiss anybody or have sex with anybody, sorry. I mean, that's what they could do. That's what they could do with this test ad infinitum. They could just keep doing this every year for they, everything that came along. Is there any decline in the numbers of tests that are happening in the United States? No? New York City was doing 50,000 a week. Are they still? I think now they're saying, look, we don't need to because they're just getting a minuscule number of positives out of their 50,000. a day. Yeah. But now, right still? Now, well, this yeah. was on, I, I think, Pence said yesterday or something, 800,000 a day are the total number of tests that are being And they're pretty much... I, I actually, I had a test yesterday. I know you did. It was uh, painful, eh? It, it is painful. You did have yeah. the way up the nose thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my wife had to have that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was part of, part of the sort of return to work protocol that right. I had to have one. and. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure who financed it, but uh, but yeah. uh, but it You'll was get it. quite well, a process. You, it'll be interesting to see your bill because I've heard seven hundred to a thousand dollars is what it starts yeah. before you get your copay, and it's twenty dollars yeah. or whatever, or ten dollars or free. Well, but that, that that gets back to the broken nature of our healthcare system. Oh my gosh, yeah. And and I think you want to talk about who profits uh, by by any of this. The, the broken nature of our whole healthcare system just exacerbates that. So I feel like all of these underlying issues. Uh, all of these pre-existing conditions, if you will, that existed before the pandemic are just being exacerbated yeah. by the right. pandemic. And, and, and we darn well better take this opportunity to look at how we can fix them. Um, because I think in some respects, all of this focus on, you know, how many tests are we doing? Are we closing bars at 11? Are we, is it, are, are we where? All of the focus on that can take away from some of the underlying problems that I think just basically have led to the United States uh, and I think the data bears this out, doing worse than many of the other developed countries in the world uh, on this. Uh, so, well, you, look well, at, you look at Canada, yeah. our neighbors to Canada's the north. Canada's not so hot. They're terribly No, 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 no but I'm just but saying from the, in terms of their, their countries being taken over by this virus, either literally or figuratively, uh, it's not chaos up there the way it is down here. Uh, it just isn't. Well, the, I, the number of cases that they have, the, the day, one of the days the United States reported 70,000 cases, and, and maybe some of these are asymptomatic, maybe some of them aren't actually cases. No. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's above my pay grade. But 70,000 people were, were, were confirmed to have it. That same day, Canada had 366. You don't think the Canadian economy is going to recover more quickly than ours? Uh, so the fundamentals of the, of the economy in a country 
that is dealing with it that way is very different than what we're facing now. I don't think Canada's bars are closing down at 11 o'clock at night in Montreal. They did, they did, but they're now opening up. And the right. fact is that the United States is not recovering economically because some obviously people don't want things to be reopened. Right. I don't mean people. People right. are desperate right. to have things yeah, reopened, but our political leaders don't seem to be desperate about that. Right. I don't understand Mayor Weinberger. Well, but look who our political leaders are. Well, I'm up not and talking down. about... Up, no, up yeah, and down, okay. up and down. Yeah, yeah no, I know that. Well, if, but if you look at really what's happening, actually, President Trump wants to recover the yeah. economy. Mayor well, Weinberger doesn't seem to be wanting that. Well, look, I think the mayor has been a good bureaucrat over the past... Which mayor? Mayor Weinberger. He's been a good bureaucrat over the past however many... How many years has he been in office? He's been in now two terms, two which terms. is six, so, six years. So, so, you know, before this, our books were apparently balanced better. But what's fundamentally lacking, and what I think is so important for real leadership, is a vision. Look, yeah. we've lurched from one Wall Street scheme in this city to the next. Whether it's the hole in the ground, yes, uh, 250 million dollars promised by another Don, Don Sinex, uh, from New York City, uh, and look, you and I and, and Pete have been saying for years that this wasn't going to work. Uh, well, and, the Burlington Telecom thing, and, and it didn't, Gee. and it didn't, and we, and, and then we moved to Burlington Telecom. We, we, then we flipped to let's privatize Church Street. Uh, let's put a bunch of uh, yacht slips in for the Canadians. I mean, it's lurching from one thing to another without any encompassing vision. And so I think that's what's really missing. The mayor has done some things well uh, uh, from a bureaucratic, technocratic perspective, but there's no vision. There's no his, vision his for vision, bringing Burlington right, back. We're his, adrift right, in Lake Champlain. Right. His vision always was to get us out of debt, I think. But and, yeah. Well, that's and we're that's, back in debt. I know, big time. Right. So anyway, now we need a vision to bring us back. Okay. The thing that, that I find community. puzzling about the whole COVID thing is that there have been pandemics, I guess, before. Mm -hmm. Never has there been shutdowns of the entire economy. Right. Never. So is it? What happened, Pete? What it's this think? test. I'm telling you. Yeah. Well, it's, but it's, that was before the test that the shutdowns were made. No, no. What happened? It, it, they're, they're, what happened was people were getting sick. They immediately started. I mean, you can look and the testing and it got ramped up, and then all of a sudden the cases, like all of a sudden they see how many cases there are, and it's like I mean it's instantaneous because there was a lot of people that were asymptomatically mm -hmm. ill, and and all of a sudden they said, oh my gosh, we have all these cases. And so they said, and, you know, but this didn't happen previously because they weren't testing healthy people. You mm -hmm. know, they, they only, only people that were sick. And, you know, that's the difference between our country and many other countries. China, I mean, it, it, it's really comical. People say, well, what did China do? China had 4,500 deaths. That's where the that's thing all? started. That's all, mm -hmm. 4,500. And they were all in one area. And you have a, a province, I think it's called Hubei, where Wuhan is, had all the deaths. The one next to it, I can't pronounce the name, starts with a J has 50 million people, zero deaths, touching it. Okay, that would be like, that'd be like New York City having all the deaths and New Jersey having none. I mean, it's a bigger area, but it's kooky. Yeah. Well, they don't, you know, who knows what happened, but they also don't report deaths that are heart attack as mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's what the United States is doing. And then the other thing you can read the CDC documents, which they didn't do in 09 with swine flu. Mm -hmm. They have underlying symptoms now, and it says in here, you can assume, you can assume, you can presume, if you think it contributed to the death, just put COVID. So you can die of 25 different things as underlying conditions. And I had a list. I mean, ischemic, heart failure, mm. renal failure, diabetes, diabetes mm. Alzheimer's, asthma. The list is long. Suicide. And mm. if the coroner or medical examiner that does the cause of death and lists it, and there's the way the form is written, there's the immediate and there's underlying. And they're telling you right in here that if COVID is on there, list heart disease or as underlying and not as the main cause of death yeah. that completely changes the figures that yeah. we're getting because 90 I see 84 no only six percent of the COVID reported deaths were had only COVID on them all the other had between two and five underlying symptoms which are and that's why you see lots of people in retirement homes people in you know hospices mm -hmm. because yeah. these people were already really sick and it's just like with pneumonia, which this actually is, is a kind of yeah. pneumonia, that that's what people die of. They, you know, mm -hmm. they're in there, they, they're sick, and then they get some kind of respiratory illness. So yes, this is another respiratory illness, and it's hitting the people who get infected easily because mm -hmm. they're they're sick. But in the past, they would write down he died from a heart attack. Mm -hmm. 
because of this. Yeah. And who, I mean, who was this organized? You talked about who's benefiting. The pharmaceutical companies have to be just giddy about this whole thing right. because it's all, you know, there's 50 of them working on a vaccine. They're getting billions of dollars to try to make one. They're making, we were talking about the test. I, I looked this up. There's 32 companies approved for this test. All these little companies you've never heard of. 30 million, they want 30 million tests distributed or 50 million. So let's say each little Still? company. Yeah, each little company gets to sell 1 million tests for a $100 profit, which is probably way under. They made $100 million sending out a little plastic thing to wherever they get, they send it to. Mm -hmm. Some company you've so never heard of. So what you're basically saying is that you're asking the question of who benefits. We know who benefits, well, right? Well, we don't. That's I don't think that that's this correct. Is a, this is the perfect example. So I mean by the underlying The healthcare system is completely broken. The healthcare broken. system is completely broken. You shouldn't, you, nobody should profit on that. Right, really? right now they have more that's power absurd. than the Pentagon. Yeah. I mean, they talk about the players, like we talked about 20 years ago, it was the military industrial complex, it was Wall Street, some other big corporations. Well, now you have Google, you have Amazon, you have Microsoft, you have all these pharmaceutical companies that are have more power mm -hmm. or as much power really as the Pentagon in, 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 in decisions. So, and certainly yeah. as much power as the government. Yeah, I mean, Matt Taibbi just wrote an article in Rolling Stone I about that. that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it, it, it's, you can, it's hard to read it. Right. There's the one company got approval for a drug for COVID. They thought it was going to be fair to charge forty-eight thousand dollars a dose. What? Yeah, forty-eight thousand. So then they said, "Well, gosh, maybe that's too much." It was like a construction estimate. And then they went, "Well, um, we'll bring it down to three thousand dollars a dose." All this drug did was possibly shorten your time in the hospital by four days. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the, and the government, because they control the government, will give them money for it. It's 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 corporate welfare. Yeah. I passed a right. woman on the drive in here. Uh, maybe you did too, uh, on the corner of of, uh, of the street with a with a, a ski pole and a cup attached to yeah, it. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. yeah, reaching out to people driving by yeah. to get a few pennies, uh, and we've got people in Congress who are screaming bloody murder um, uh, uh, about the fact that um, people are are getting a a, 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 a pandemic on unemployment assistance uh, that that's now over. When in fact, if you look at the data, poverty in this country for the first time in a long time went down when uh, during the the existence of the pandemic yeah because pandemic the government was handing out money well, right exactly right. and so I, I think instead of handing it out to the uh the bezos of the world right. the, the 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 pfizers of the world the novavax the modernas of the world right. and giving them corporate welfare why does that poor woman uh, have to be out there with her little cup mm -hmm. why do the people have to walk by my house every every uh, friday today and pick through my recycling bin uh, for my cheap domestic beer that I buy because I can't afford all the fancy Vermont beer. Yeah, uh, don't believe it. Yeah, yeah. Th that 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 is that is sickening to me. Um, and again, not to sort of get away from the the the, the pandemic because that I think is illustrating all of these inequalities. Um, but I want I really think part of what the city needs to do is start focusing on those sorts of things. Um, get back to business. If we can, if we can safely open restaurants, do it. Yeah. Uh, if we can safe, safely open stores, there's no reason in my mind that we can't safely open uh, city government and uh, libraries so, and, and public spaces yes. like libraries. Yeah. Uh, again, safety is important. We've got to do it safely, but I don't see how we can't welcome. If we can Look welcome it. people back into the shops and the bars and the restaurants and say sort that that's of. safe, uh, well, we should be able to do that with city government. I mean, that's right. democracy. Right. Well, I had a, um, an ongoing con uh, conversation, we'll say, with the libraries. I do discussion groups with people like our age in the libraries where we've always discussed current mm -hmm. events. They've been very a lot of fun, for instance. So I want the libraries open because I don't want to do these discussion groups on Zoom, which to me are very ineffective, better than nothing, I guess, mm -hmm. but very ineffective. Mm -hmm. So I've been having this ongoing discussion with the library, and they continue to say, oh, well, we have to be safe. Oh, we have to be safe. Our workers have blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And I finally said to the librarians, we are a creative, great people. Mm -hmm. And we are great Vermonters. We are great Americans. We have the intelligence to open safely and creatively, and that has got to happen. Well, and, it's... I yeah, mean, I, mean, I have faith in normal people. It, well, that's that's what that's the point of remembering that we are exceptional, reminding ourselves yeah, that, that we can do this, that we can get back up, and we can find creative solutions. To like you problems. said, like you said, and you said, we have gone through crises before, and it's been the ingenuity of the American people and the Vermonters right. in particular 
who have led us out of that because we are creative. Why can't we open the libraries, well, as you, you said? Know, I, I don't understand either. They, they want to look at all this data, and see, but the data is telling us to reopen. So I don't understand I don't. what they're looking at. I don't you know, either. It, it makes no sense to me. The data, I mean, nobody's died in two months in Vermont, right? And there's been I, one person in the hospital apparently in the mm -hmm. last two, three weeks. So it's totally insignificant. It's such a small number, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So w what data? I mean, wh what are they looking at? What are they thinking about? Is somebody else, is the federal government, is somebody else, is the CDC, is the NIH? Who's telling our leaders that they can't open? I don't understand. Is it our the Vermont Health Department? I mean, who's telling them? What, what, what are they looking at? I don't understand. <laughs> well, I mean, Governor Scott says every day, every other day, why we can't reopen. But who's why, telling? Well, who's I don't know. Well, but I, I would. I mean, I think there are. I mean, I walk down Church Street, and, and and I would say, by and large, and I think this gets back to this point about city government in particular, and, and certainly libraries and other public spaces. I mean, I think to a large extent, uh, aside from after 11 p.m. at night at the at the bars downtown, I think. The, the commerce downtown is very much open. Sort of. Uh, well, you see people there. Let's yes, put it that you way. do. You do. Uh, and Thank so heavens. I think. Thank I think. Heavens. I think. I mean, I don't know. What, maybe we go around and say, what would be one th thing you'd do if you were mayor for a day? Uh, I think one thing that 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 we should be looking at in the city, aside from sort of a, a, a vision for our community, but also how can we open up city government so that people have access to city services and city government. Uh, because a lot of people don't have access to broadband, a lot of people don't have access to the internet, mm -hmm. uh, particularly within our immigrant community. Uh, my kids are in Sustainability Academy, which we love. It's a wonderfully diverse community. Uh, and I sat through lots of Zoom classes with them last spring and some this summer, uh, where it was very obvious that a large segment of the population really wasn't able to interact right. virtually. Uh, so what about those people? You know, how do you how do they engage with government? And they're such an important, fundamental part of our community. So I'm really concerned about the continuation of a closed down government to at least some version of in-person interaction. That's what I've been concerned about most from because day one. Because it's discriminatory one. against the most I mean, how, vulnerable how does among the America, us. How does the city council get away with saying this and making it a resolution and closing mm -hmm. down? basically closing down bars at 11 o'clock at night. Where do they get that legal authority? I think they get it from the emergency, they say, yeah. from the emergency powers of the, mm -hmm. of the governor. Well, there's no emergency anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no emergency. Yeah, that's what I don't understand. And, well. and I don't, and, but the, the greater thing to me is the total collapse, as I see it, of civilization in a lot of ways. Our economy is busted, yeah. our government is busted, and, be, and operating behind screens. Our libraries are basically busted. Our schools, are we gonna really force students, little kids, mm -hmm. to be on devices? Well, well I, I will say this, as somebody that has kids in the, in the schools, I do think what the schools are doing, at least from my own they're experience trying. right now, I do think they're trying to strike a balance. Yes. So right now, just people are allowed to choose if they want to be virtual or in person, at least for part of that time. And, and the, the reason I say that I, I, I like that approach is because I think the other thing to remember, especially in a small community like Burlington, is everybody is going to have different levels of comfort. Uh, and so you need to try to be able to meet people halfway. Otherwise, we're, we are going to end up in this thing where it's like, you know, us versus them, yeah, I know. one side yelling at the other, and we're never really going to get there. So I think this approach allows people who maybe just still aren't comfortable uh, to, to, to do it virtually and those people that really need the, 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 the in-person classes and want that to be able to do it. So I do think the schools are trying to strike, strike the right balance and I, I get back to that point. If we can do it in the schools, if we can do it in the stores, if we can do it in the bars, if we can do it in the restaurants, how is the most fundamental part of our democracy, city government at the city level, uh, still offering no in-person interaction zero, zero. Uh, as far as I know? Right. And that's troubling. Right. What do you think, Pete? Well, if I was mayor, which I will never be, or no, governor. No, because you don't live here in the first place. I don't live here. No, I live in Vermont. I live in Charlotte. But uh, yeah, to me, there's absolutely, I mean, I understand if people are worried and scared, and I, I respect the fact that yeah. they want to have their kids at home because the media blitz has been relentless. Right. I mean, I'm one of the few people, and they're probably 10 or 20% like Sandy and I, who just don't believe this thing. We just mm -hmm. think it's been overblown beyond beyond anything beyond anything reasonable okay um, I mean to me part of the big problem was the whole the whole lockdown 
was worse than if we had been open, and I'll give you the reasoning. I mean, almost every place there was a lockdown, there was a surge within two weeks afterwards. Right. What we did is we told everybody to go inside their house, which kind of had to happen because you couldn't go anywhere else. I mean, they weren't definitely locked up in their house. So if you had a sick person, they were all together with the healthy people, making them sick, okay? Other places, if you had somebody sick, they either went to the hospital, you isolate them, and everybody stayed to work. And then you say, I mean, this is just like time-tested stuff. You have a fever, you have a cold, you have a cough, stay away. Mm -hmm. Don't go to work, stay home. There, there's no difference between this and, and what happened, and what should have happened in this thing. If you're sick, stay home. And that's the approach a lot of other countries used. And I mean, that's the approach Sweden used, and people criticized it, but their their economy is better than any economy in, in Europe right now. It the didn't dip down. Are okay their too. death rates were about the same or a little lower. Yeah. So instead of having this, they just had like a flat line thing, yeah. you know, and then it, and it was over with. So it, it was just it was all just ridiculous to me that 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 there was this panic about this thing. It was the worst thing ever. But if if you look back at all the other ones, and you, you read the book, this has been tried before. There's always been hair and fire thing whether it was the bird flu the swine flu mm -hmm. there's always been when it first came out this is going to be the worst thing ever and then it never kind of really panned out mm -hmm. i mean i mean you can go back to 1918 but none of us are that old i know i'm not but, but so i mean none of these other things really ever were that horrible but in the beginning if you go back and read the newspaper in about 2009 mm -hmm. they were saying all the same things right. oh my gosh but they all went away and they and and the, the whole wave that in company of that w it wasn't legitimate enough to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Because of what we're doing now, the way we change the classification of death and the testing, this enables this thing longer than it needs to be enabled. Yeah. Because um, you're, you're we're, like I said, we keep, I keep saying, you keep telling people you have to get a test even though they have no symptoms. Well, I feel fine, sorry, you have to get a test. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just, it. you know, and, and the thing I didn't point out about this test is, it doesn't tell you that you even have a live infectious virus. All it tells you is you have a snippet of RNA mm -hmm. that matches up with the snippet mm -hmm. of RNA that they've identified as being this virus. Okay, and then they have to go through this big process. They heat it, they cool it, they amplify it, and then they do this thing with cycles where if, if it gets detected early, that means mm -hmm. it's in your system. But you can, once again, you can go on the CDC website and it'll tell you, a positive PCR test does not tell you you have infectious virus, okay? So right. it doesn't tell you what people think it tells you. Mm -hmm. It just tells you that you have something in you that may possibly, just like all these other things, make you sick. Okay, what I was always shocked at, and maybe we should conclude pretty soon, um, what I was always shocked at was the, the virus thing, as you point out, that, that um, the fact of the virus, of course, is also medically not totally proven in the first place. Right. But what shocked me about this, even if you accept it, was the shutdowns. That never happened in history before, as I pointed out. We've had a lot of viruses, a lot of epidemics, a lot of pandemics. Healthy society did not collapse. Right. And, and our society is, to me, and I may be an extremist, on the verge of collapse. Mm -hmm. Economic collapse, political collapse. What happened to the United States of America? We are a people who have done magnificent stuff and also a lot of bad stuff, Vermonters as well. I believe that we have to get that spirit back and recreate our society right. and I that like we have the ability absolutely. to do it. And in line with that, to close, I wanted you to talk a little bit about what might happen politically. Yeah, well, lots is going to happen politically. Obviously, we've got a presidential election. We've got... Uh, state level gubernatorial uh, elections but I think one of the things that I always um, think about is how can I, mean, I grew up in a family of activists people that were engaged trying to make the community a better place environmentally social justice uh, teachers mm -hmm. and and that really instilled me with this idea that one should try to give back to the community they live in you can really have an impact yes. at the local level I believe that uh, too, yeah. and so I think it's certainly time to start thinking about um, and exploring who is going to lead Burlington moving forward. And I think we need someone with a real vision. Um, we've had a bureaucratic and technocratic approach that perhaps has helped balance some books, but now it's time to build Burlington back. Uh, it's time better. to, it, to build Burlington back and better. Absolutely. Three B's, alliteration. Yeah. Build Burlington back better um, so that we aren't simply lurching from one development project to the next with no real comprehensive vision and reminding ourselves and that's the role of the mayor to lead mm -hmm. to remind ourselves that we are exceptional 
that we can get back up from this and that Burlington can lead not only Vermont, but quite frankly, the entire country as we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to start exploring what that might look like uh, and, and, and who's best situated to do that. Um, and I don't know whether it's Pete, you, maybe me. Not uh, him, he lives in uh, Charlotte, uh, give so him a Pete's, break. Pete's excluded. I'm a foreigner. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but I think the time has come, and I think the, the people of Burlington uh, are ready for that. They're ready for, for uh, a, a new vision, because I think there is a sentiment that we've been adrift, uh, right. and, and it's time to, to tack, to continue the Lake Champlain uh, analogy, and get back on track, okay. and uh, make Burlington a leader again. And I think that means that there's a mayor's race in March mm -hmm. that we are all going to attend to, right? Absolutely. Um, and last, I just want to say something on a more or less a personal level. I live in a student neighborhood, and I live on Loomis Street, which is in the heart of the student ghetto. And everybody in that neighborhood, except me and a couple of others, um, are really trying to control the students coming back. And some people are even suggesting that students, UVM students, Champlain students and others, should not come back because they see them as some sort of a vector of mm -hmm. some kind of a disease. I would say from the bottom of my heart, I welcome the students back in this town. If they can come back safely, of course, that would be the ideal situation. But we, in my view, have to have young people back in this community studying at UVM to preserve UVM and to preserve the cultural and economic benefits that they bring to this whole community. So I'm just saying welcome back students, even though they might not hear it from many people. Right. I welcome them back, and I hope they do come back. That's so important. with that, I think that, we, that what's happening maybe will occur in a couple weeks. But thank you, especially to CCTV, which showed up in person to tape this program. It's not a Zoom presentation. It's held at the wonderful and beautiful St. John's Club. And I thank CCTV in particular for coming out to do this today. Yes. And thanks, Jared yeah. and Pete, for being here with me. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Sandy. Always All a right. pleasure. Thank you.